Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching The Daily Debrief. On the show today, we look at the violation of democratic institutions which continues almost unabated in major world nations already in the early days of 2023. We'll examine uh, the new Brazilian government's response to a violent riot and storming of key buildings in the capital, Brasilia. In the United States, uh, do events in the House of Representatives over the past few days portend policy and governance paralysis over the next two years. And finally, uh, Israel has a new set of punitive measures against Palestinians and why the new government there is now directly targeting the Palestinian Authority. First up, in response to the organized invasion of the Supreme Federal Court, the National Congress and the Planalto Palace, which is the office of the president, uh, this is all in Brazil, by supporters of the far-right former president Jair Bolsonaro on Sunday, the Lula government has taken rapid steps to safeguard democratic institutions and curtail the impact of this attempted coup. Bolsonaro and his supporters have, for years, raised false and unbacked accusations against Brazil's electoral system, leading up to the shocking scenes that we witnessed on TV yesterday and today wherein thousands of far-right hooligans went on a rampage in, in Brasilia uh, in a continued rejection of the election results in which Bolsonaro lost to current president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva. Zoe joins me more uh, for more on this developing story. Right, Zoe, since uh, dawn has broken in that part of the world, what further details are you getting in terms of report coming in from various parts of Brazil? Uh, and what's the government's response been to this uh, what has to be called an attempted coup? Well, uh, since this morning, the arrests have been continuing. Um, the army has now evicted one of the major Bolsonarista camps that was outside one of the army uh, quartels uh, bases in Brasilia. Over a thousand people have been arrested until now. A thousand two hundred people, I think, to be exact. Those arrests, I think, will continue. As we know, there were thousands of people that actually traveled to Brasilia to carry out this attempted coup. And meanwhile, in uh, Sao Paulo and in the south of the country, uh, road blockades have been erected, uh, burning tires, um, impeding traffic. So uh, it's yet to be seen how those will be dealt with. Uh, we know that in earlier moments, especially right after the elections, uh, actually the the highway police worked with these Bolsonaristas, were refusing to stop these blockades. So it's definitely a developing situation. However, the federal government has called uh, for all of the people that participated in these actions, who financed these actions, uh, who are in any way related to permitting that these take place, be um, tried and be uh, brought to justice. Uh, Lula gave a very, very firm speech yesterday saying that no one will go unpunished. Um, also important to point out that and we wrote, a, uh, we shared an article um, from Brasil de Fato about this, is about the complicity of uh, the federal district's governor, um, Ivanes Rocha. He actually was responsible for scaling down the security in Brasilia around the, the, the minister's esplanade, um, essentially allowing this to take place. He also appointed uh, the Bolsonaro's minister of justice and security as the federal district's justice for minister of security. So because of all these reasons, he's actually been taken out of his post. He's been taken away for three months. This is a very strong action. You know, right after uh, last night, after Lula's address, after the decree that he said that there would be federal intervention in the police forces, Ivanes made a pronouncement and said that he was very sorry and that he didn't approve of what had happened. But of course, that's really too little too late. Uh, knowing that these buses were headed to Brasilia, knowing about the threat of violence that had been shared really widely on social media. This actually, while it is a shocking event, it is not shocking that it happened. They had been announcing it for days. They had made major preparations and plans to actually carry this out. And so the fact that uh, the security forces in Brasilia were not prepared and really intentionally were not preparing um, they believe is the fault of Ibanez Rocha, and as such, he has been taken um, uh, taken aside. Right. Uh, Bolsonaro is currently in the United States, uh, Zoe, and, and there's pressure from within the Democratic Party on Joe Biden to sort of take steps towards repatriating him towards Brazil so he can face the consequences of, of the, uh, this orchestrated plot. Uh, what is the progress on that? What have the reactions been from the, I suppose, political establishment and other sections in the U.S.? 
Well, it's quite interesting because many people have compared what happened on January 8th to uh, January 6th, 2021, and they're quite right for that. Um, the images are very silent, uh, similar. The actions that they carried out are very similar, just complete destruction of these state institutions um, related to allegations of electoral fraud. Of course, in this case, it's a bit bizarre because Bolsonaro is already out of the country. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's actually any possibility that he would return and even take office. He himself seems to have a defeatist attitude. Um, so that's one major difference. But I think because of these similarities, I really uh, struck a nerve with Democrats who were also kind of the target of this um, this style of uh, invasion, in a sense. Um, and even before the elections, many Democrats had made statements and pronouncements um, regarding the possibility of a January 6th style scenario in Brazil. And many of them warned about this and said that, for example, uh, some members of Congress had tried to pass a clause saying that the uh, aid to Brazil would be contingent on the armed forces not responding to these um, to the elections, etc. Um, so I think what we saw yesterday is that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez took a very, very bold position and said that she condemned what was happening in Brasilia, and she called on the U.S. government to cease giving refuge to Jair Bolsonaro. He traveled to Florida on December 30th, uh, maybe thinking that he would be received by Donald Trump at mar a lago uh, but he was not. <laughs> um, and now he's staying with a Brazilian MMA fighter in Florida, kind of just wandering around, enjoying the fact that he doesn't have to really face up to any of the crimes he committed as president. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Alexandre Castro Cortez, Joaquin Castro, they're all calling for him to be extradited to Brazil. Um, there are multiple investigations that have been opened up into Jair Bolsonaro, even when he was president. Um, and especially now um, with this coup attempt, with his supporters carrying this out. And I'm sure that once the investigations are underway, there will be clear uh, indications of his participation, of members of his government, his former government's participation in everything that happened. Um, and so that's uh, that's one of the reasons I don't think this has advanced. While the United States government and Joe Biden himself have released statements condemning what happened, um, so far they've showed no signs of kind of moving on this demand to extradite Jair Bolsonaro. Thanks very much, uh, Zoe. And we'll ho hear from you uh, uh, on Brazil in the next few days, I'm sure. Right, as pressure mounts on U.S. President uh, Joe Biden to from his own party, to return uh, Jair Bolsonaro, of course, who is living in the U.S. at the moment, back to his home country. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. House of Representatives have elected Republican Kevin McCarthy as its speaker after being voted down on the first 14 attempts. Anish has been following this story closely and joins us with his take on the events as well as the impact they might have. Anish, uh, welcome back to the show. It's kind of ironic but also somehow fitting that uh, these events concluded almost two years exactly after the January 6, uh, 21 uh, riots and that Kevin McCarthy was elected speaker after, uh, you know, all the drama that took place that sometimes seemed like episodes of a, of a sitcom even. Uh, what, what, what did you make of it both uh, procedurally as well as the actual battle that was ongoing? Uh, and what, what are your sort of uh, key takeaways from this entire situation? Well, one takeaway is uh, that the the pro-Trump uh, sort of faction within the what is called as the Freedom House Caucus uh, of the Republican Party, uh, which is a small minority within the Republican Party itself, uh, which was divided during the whole speaker election. But a very small number actually managed to get a lot more than uh, they could have imagined uh, in like maybe a, with a larger majority. So the fact that Republicans uh, won just a very small majority actually helped them uh, quite a bit and that gave them the leverage to uh, extract the sort of demands that would eventually give them the power to do what they want in the house or more power than what they would have usually had in an earlier uh, version of how things worked in the house so uh, some of the uh, takeaways that we can think of is like the fact that this could have been done earlier by the left within or the so-called left within the democratic party but we are not going to get into that but it's the fact that uh, a lot of things uh, were possible in an earlier uh, house uh, house of representatives under a democratic majority which did not happen and that only saddens it that the fact that this was demonstrated by a very right wing a very 
sort of uh, you know pro trump kind of uh, grouping a very small minority to begin with which is which was not very successful also in the elections uh, which kind of did that extraction from the house which actually made it uh like at least uh, on paper far more democratic some of the if you look at some of the demands that they got uh include the fact that uh, even a single member can initiate a sort of uh, a speaker reelection uh, uh and that was something that uh, pre- uh, that the previous democratic uh, majority in the house actually kind of overturned and turned it into a, a, a like requiring at least five members of the house to do that uh the uh, all other things include the fact that they want an internal majority uh to decide on what kind of bills and what kind of legislations uh, are introduced in the house and will be passed within the house and that is an important thing because we have to remember that the american con- congressional system does not work in the same way that parliamentary systems around the world do or even most legislatures even within a presidential system works uh so it's more or less uh, the the leadership within the ruling bloc that pretty much dictates the entire business within the house obviously there are individual members who do end up uh, you know uh, tabling bills and everything but the if you look at the significant ones and especially spending bills and so on uh, those are uh, something that the leadership of the majority bloc decides and if the majority and this sort of majority within the majority is kind of like a very westminster thing as well uh that the ruling blocks majority will now set uh, sort of set the agenda for the house uh the speaker uh, gets reduced uh, like a cut in size in many ways because of that it also brings down the powers of the establishment within the republican party on how things work not just in the congressional uh, point of view but uh, or the legislative point of view but also within how uh, the party works uh, outside of the congress as well so these are very significant demands these are very procedural demands we have to remember that none of these are very poli- clear cut policy demands very few actually they, they do have some policy demands that they made and we think that uh, they, those have been agreed upon but these procedural demands are the ones that are going to empower this small group of 19 uh, congressmen uh, to essentially now decide a whole host of things in the coming two years of the house Uh, it makes sense anish but we also have to like you were pointing out uh, move on to the governance and policy sort of impact that this will have uh, for the next 2 years uh, are we likely to see a complete paralysis of uh, government essentially yes yeah, so uh, we need to really uh, remember some of the very little uh, policy details that were uh, cl- made clear and were uh, demanded by this small group of 19 uh right wing congress uh, congress persons include apart from obviously board, increasing border policing also includes budget cuts uh spending cuts uh, massive spending cuts that can actually uh also affect uh, the military uh, or the defense budget that the us uh, has uh, recently passed and uh, that in itself is something that the, a majority of republicans uh who call themselves moderates obviously uh, but are pretty much just conservatives uh would not be very happy with because uh, they are very happy with welfare cuts they are happy with cuts on uh, education on other sorts of uh, things but they are never happy with uh, any kind of spending cut on the military and that especially considering the fact that uh, the very right wing of the republican party are of the opinion that the war in ukraine is very costly to the united states this is definitely another sort of ideological line that is so obviously they can threaten complete policy paralysis they can just paralyze the entire congress if they want to because obviously the small majority is going to unless obviously uh, the republicans uh, cross the aisle and you know uh, gain support from the democrats which can also happen we have seen that happen multiple times when it comes to uh, defense spending and uh, foreign policy issues uh but obviously these people have uh, shown that they can actually put the entire proceedings of the house to a stand still if they want to and they are quite you know stubborn in many ways in getting what they want all right Thank you very much anish for that detailed update on what's going on in the us and finally israel's government has revoked the travel permits of the palestinian authority's foreign minister riyad al maliki along with several other prominent palestinians who are allowed to use these permits to freely move in and out of the occupied territories on diplomatic political and other governance related work 
the Netanyahu government claims that the move is part of a series of punitive measures taken by, uh, by it against the Palestinian Authority for pushing a United Nations General Assembly vote last month. The vote sought a legal opinion from the International Court of Justice on the status of the Israeli occupation. Abdul is in studio now and joins us more uh, for more details on this story. Abdul, welcome back to the show. Uh, We've seen this year already the new government in place and a series of uh, steps, measures, this time being called retaliatory measures, uh, being taken by the Israeli government against Palestinians uh, living in the occupied territories. What, what is the sort of, uh, what led up to uh, the latest set of announcements and measures, including the blocking of, of a visa to the foreign minister? Well, uh, I think on December 30th, uh, there was a, a UN vote in General Assembly, which basically talked about uh, is mo mostly a, a rhetorical uh, resolution which talks about uh, le taking legal opinion from the International Court of Justice about the status of uh, the Israeli occupation. Mm. Of course, the resolution, despite the fact that you, uh, Israel was very dismissive about the entire process, uh, ha it seems that Israel has not, uh, ha there is some of effect mm. o o about of that resolution. And this, the extremist uh, right-wing government, which Israel now has, has basically taken it on heart and now basically are trying to corner the Palestinian Authority, mm. claiming that what they are doing is uh, against the interest of the Israel. Um, and therefore, they have uh, not only uh, uh, taken some kind of uh, 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 travel restrictions, imposed some kind of travel restrictions on certain significant uh, officials of the Palestinian Authority in violation of the Oslo Agreement. Of course, um, for example, the foreign minister, uh, when he was coming back from Brazil, uh, there was, uh, he, he came to know that his uh, uh, permit has been revoked. Mm. It means that there is no difference between uh, uh, the PA officials uh, and uh, uh, the common Palestinians who have to take uh, permission every time they want to move out from uh, out of the Palest uh, occupied uh, territories. Mm. So uh, uh, that is one. Uh, apart from that, uh, uh, they have also uh, transferred around $39 uh, million from the Palestinian uh, 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 authorities' tax collections. Uh, according to the Oslo Agreement, there is an arrangement uh, uh, where the taxes are collected by the Israeli government hmm. and they are transferred to the this Palestinian Authority from the occupied territories. Hmm. And uh, while the transferring, they have uh, kept With $39 him. million dollars of that crucial fund, right. uh, uh, claiming that now it will go to the Palestinian uh, victims of the terrorism in Israel instead of uh, what they claim that Palestinians uh, give this uh, money to uh, encourage terrorism. Hmm. It means the Palestinians have been using uh, a part of their uh, uh, revenue to help the families who were basically affected by the uh, Israeli armed forces killing uh, and other uh, uh, imprisonments and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, apart from that, there are also uh, separate, uh, sub, uh, several other measures. For example, uh, uh, Itamar ben -Gwir, who is now the National uh, Security Minister, has banned uh, uh, Palestinian, uh, sorry, Israeli lawmakers to visit Palestinian prisoners. Uh, he has also uh, announced the banning of uh, any display of Palestinian flag mm. as a promotion. He claims is, uh, waving Palestinian flag is promotion of uh, terrorism and so on and so forth. So these are the measures which uh, Israeli government uh, has taken. Uh, against that vote. Mm. In the financial sense, uh, Abdul, this is taking a, a sort of a play out of the United States' book and what they did exactly. with Afghanistan. Exactly. Uh, by saying it is for victims of terrorism, but just, you know, Israeli exactly. victims exactly. instead of Palestinians. What kind of impact will this have? Of course, the economic impact is quite obvious. Palestinians uh, are already uh, in a very bad condition when it comes to economic. Not only because uh, uh, of the Israeli blockade on Gaza, which has deteriorated the economic conditions there, made it one of the uh, worst uh, uh, places to live in. Uh, uh, even the West Bank, uh, 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 the, the COVID, of course, has an Im impact. Apart from that, the other global uh, uh, events also have an impact. Yeah. Apart from that, the occupation itself is a big uh, uh, reason for the uh, uh, deteriorating economic conditions in uh, the West Bank. Mm. Uh, they are not allowed 
allowed to export freely the the imports are also restricted mm. um, the foreign uh, funding which used to be a very crucial uh, uh, source of palestinian uh, uh, in uh, kind of revenue has also been restricted uh, in last few years uh, so uh, over and above that whatever extra uh, whatever uh, revenue was coming even from that a significant part mm. 39 million dollars is a big amount for a small economy uh, in right, West right. Bank. Uh, so it, it is going to impact uh, massively uh, as far as the economic uh, part is concerned. Apart from that, the travel restrictions mm -hmm. will create a lot of problem yeah. for a Palestinian authority uh, to kind of carry forward uh, their mission. Because uh, uh, now the Palestinian authority, if we talk about only that part of Palestinian resistance, mm -hmm. uh, is mostly relying on the making international public opinion against the occupation's tactics. And uh, if they have to seek uh, a visa each time they want to move out uh, from the West Bank, it, it means their one-to-one uh, -one, uh, contact with the foreign diplomats is going to be massively uh, affected. Whether this will sustain, this measure will remain in practice for long or not, mm. we do not know. Mm. Uh, but given the statements which uh, uh, Itmar ben Guir, uh, Netanyahu and other ministers in the uh, uh, Israeli uh, uh, government have made uh, yesterday, it seems they are quite uh, uh, convinced that this measure will uh, go on further. In fact, uh, 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 Smotri uh, is one of the ministers mm. in Israeli government. Mm even said that he does not care if the PA uh, uh, remains in existence or not. Uh, and that is a co contrast from the previous uh, administrations in Israel, which no matter how, what, they wanted to keep the Palestinian uh, Authority intact. So this time it seems they don't want uh, uh, the Palestinian, they are attacking the Palestinian Authority itself. itself. All right, thank you very much for that update, Abdul. That's all we have on this episode of The Daily Debrief. Uh, as always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for more details on these stories as well as all of the other work we do. Also, don't forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back same time, same place tomorrow with another episode. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.